Welcome, everybody, to another Bible study from the Lifeway Explore the Bible curriculum. Today is session number seven, and the title is The Gospel's Power. Our passage is Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 23. And I just want to thank you for joining me. Uh, pray for me as I put these studies online, and I look forward to hearing from you in your comments. And thank you. I'm going to go to the PowerPoint slides here. Today is the Gospel's Power, as you can see there. And it comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 23. Before we go too much further, let's ask the Lord to bless this teaching today. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that our hearts will be open to the message you have for each of us today. I want to thank you so much for the power of the gospel to transform our lives, to free us from sin, to assure us of eternal life. Lord, help us to grasp the fullness of what you've done for us and help us to offer to you without any reservation our lives while we remain here help us to live in a way that pleases you in jesus holy name amen all righty the gospel's power from the book of colossians chapter 1 verses 9 through 23 the apostle paul is uh, writing this we think from from prison and it's hard to get that man down no matter what his circumstances are he's relying on the Lord and his contentment and his joy comes from knowing he's in Christ and uh, he is perfectly safe as a result of being in Christ. And it's good for us to know our true identity, our position in Christ, uh, know the blessings and the benefits of being in Christ, and really think seriously on these uh, benefits that Christ has provided for us. When we're uncertain or maybe doubtful, we tend to worry and be anxious. There's really nothing for a child of God to be anxious about. Our true contentment and joy is in Christ himself. And uh, the more we understand who he is and what he's done for us and how trustworthy he is about carrying through on his promises to deliver us from sin and death and to grant us uh, a place in his eternal kingdom, the more joy and contentment we can know. Last week's lesson was on the joy and the contentment that's to be found in knowing Christ Jesus. And uh, today we're looking at the gospel's power and we'll explore the different um, uh, ways the the gospel empowers believers. The uh, power of the gospel, number one, frees us from sin, and it frees us from Satan's control. And Christ himself enables believers to live a God-honoring life. Christ has the power to free us absolutely and completely from sin. And Christ's death makes it possible for people to be reconciled to God. On that second point, Christ's life, which he freely imparts to us, is totally free from sin, and we participate in that life. We'll talk um, about these points here as we go on. Well, Suppose you were guilty of a death penalty sin uh, or a crime. Let's say you're guilty of a death penalty crime, and uh, you've been found guilty, you've been sentenced to die, but you're fortunate enough to receive a full pardon from someone who has the authority to grant that pardon, then, once the pardon is received, you are free to go. And uh, I want to put an interesting case here. How might receiving a pardon for a past wrong impact how a person lives after receiving that pardon? What would you do if 
at one point in your life, you're on death row, about to be sentenced to death, about to be executed, and then you receive a full pardon and you're released and set free. What impact would that have on your life? Well, I have an example here from uh, our United States history. John Mitchell and Philip Weigel were sentenced to hang for treason. President George Washington granted them a full pardon. Though guilty, they were freed. That is the power of a pardon. The gospel of of Jesus Christ also pardons us from our guilt. Through faith in Jesus, we gain eternal forgiveness for all our sin. Believers in Jesus Christ are released from our sentence of eternal separation from God. It's really worth meditating on that to think about you and I who believe in Jesus Christ are free from the condemnation that surely was due us for our sins. We're completely free from it. Jesus himself died as our substitute. He died in our place. And in Romans chapter 6, Paul's uh, and Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul uh, counts, uh, counts it as if we ourselves died right along with Christ. Uh, in God's eyes, we did. We died with Christ. And the, there is no possibility of future punishment for those who are in Christ. There's no double jeopardy, so to speak. Well, that's a lot to think about. <laughs> And um, it's not easy to grasp. In our passage here, it's entitled Set Free. And we're looking at Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14 for this part. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. In Him we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Friends, that is an amazing promise from God. He has the full authority to inspire the Apostle Paul to write these things to us. This is God's heart. He's explaining to those of us who have received Jesus Christ by faith. He's just explaining to us what we have in Christ. And look at verse 14 there again at the very bottom. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It's staggering to, to realize that. And it's, it's, um, I'm just repeating to you again what, what God has told us in Scripture here. Um, Paul's prayer was motivated here by the report from Epaphras of their love in the Spirit. This uh, fruit of the Spirit indicated the Colossians here were fellow believers. Uh, Their love for Paul and their love of Jesus Christ uh, uh, as a fruit of the Holy Spirit who now indwelt them. They're fellow believers and all people who have 
truly received Jesus Christ by faith are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and uh, that that will they'll be known by their love for the brethren for each other, and. Uh, most of the scholars think that Epaphras had heard this gospel preached by Paul in Ephesus, and then he took the gospel over to Colossae, and there he most likely established this Colossian church. Well, Paul gave some reasons for the things that he's requested in prayer. He's asked for knowledge of God's will. It's, it's so important for believers to know God's will, and he's asked that we have spiritual wisdom and uh, actually understand uh, what God's will is for us and understand God's ways. And uh, that's what he's asking in prayer. He's asking God to grant them spiritual wisdom and understanding and a knowledge of God's will. And uh, he's, he has a purpose in this so that they would know what it means to live a life pleasing to God. And Paul also asks that the believers uh, would be strengthened with all power. Uh, it's not enough just to simply know God's will. We need the power to uh, implement God's will. And Paul is asking that the Philippian, I'm sorry, that the Colossian believers be empowered to have the endurance and the patience and the wherewithal to live a life that's pleasing to God. All right. Put that back over. Um, it's important for believers to be reminded that they are among the saints. Um, all believers, all believers are actually heirs uh, of Christ Jesus, and that's due to what God has done for them. And it is not because of anything we have done. We are simply uh, beneficiaries of the inheritance that uh, Christ has provided for us. We simply receive the blessings that he has uh, uh, made available to us. All things are uh, given to us based on what Christ himself has done. It's not because of anything we have done. We have been rescued from the consequences and the penalties of our sin. We've been rescued from darkness. We've been rescued from the domain of Satan. It's as if we actually belonged to Satan or we were Satan's children and God has uh, adopted us into his family. So we no longer belong to Satan and we don't reside under his uh, authority any longer. We're under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are as believers, we're redeemed or purchased back, and uh, God has forgiven us uh, absolutely and completely for our sins, and Satan has no power over our lives. Well, Paul wants to reassure the believers that uh, uh, because of these gospel truths, these uh, realizations that we're forgiven and we've been redeemed and we now do belong to God, maybe we'll be able to understand God's will and to follow it. If, um, if you had been released from death row uh, because someone had uh, done you a great kindness, you might have some gratitude towards that person because your life was spared well, Christ Jesus has spared our lives. We were uh, deserving of an eternity separated from God. We were uh, deserving to be punished for our sins. But because of Christ and his death on the cross, and his, his death on the cross paid the penalty in full for our sins. So there can't be any condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus because the, the penalty was paid in full by Christ on the cross. Now, before he went to the cross, from the moment of his conception right up until the time he, he died on the cross, he never sinned, ever. So he, he literally and actually lived a sinless life on our behalf. We get credit for his sinless life. 
and at the end of his life, he he laid his life down on the cross. He willingly died for us. At that time, he was paying the penalty for the sins we've committed. So we receive credit for a sinless life that he lived, and then he paid the penalty for all the sins we actually committed. So there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 9. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There's therefore now no condemnation. So think about the, the benefits that we have. And uh, just to summarize this first part, Paul has introduced himself and he's expressed thanksgiving for the believers in Colossae. And Paul told of his prayer for their spiritual growth. How would you like to have the Apostle Paul praying for your spiritual growth? Uh, they were very fortunate to have him praying for their spiritual growth. I think I have many, many people praying for me, and I'm so uh, thankful. I'm so thankful that people choose to pray for me. I, um, I, I can't, I can't even begin to imagine how valuable uh, those prayers are uh, for my own uh, spiritual understanding and spiritual growth. Uh, God imparts things to each of us, and I, I believe these prayers are extremely important. So pray for those that you love. That, that Pray this prayer here from Colossians chapter 1, starting about verse 9. Pray those prayers for the ones you love and, and pray them for yourself. Uh, God is going to um, answer those prayers. Well, Paul here, the second point, he reminded them of the position they now had as a result of Christ's redemption and forgiveness. These things are not to be taken lightly. Sometimes we, frankly, just don't realize what we have. So read these passages and meditate on them and pray over them and ask God just to reveal to you the, uh, the fullness of the blessings he's provided for us. Well, I'm going to move on now to verses 15 through 20. Uh, the title of the, of the first part there was, uh, let's see here, <laughs> set free. And now, if you carry that on a little further, by Christ. And then thirdly, we're going to study through his death. But for now, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I can tell right now there's far too much material in this lesson to cover in depth. So I'm going to cover what I can in a reasonable amount of time, and I'm going to suggest that you meditate on these things and uh, look to something called the Bible Knowledge Commentary and read some more in depth on this passage. That's one that I study quite often, the Bible Knowledge Commentary, and just look up uh, this passage, Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 20, 
and there's so much there that's uh, extremely useful. I've noticed the blueletterbible.org on the internet. Uh, there's uh, tremendous numbers of commentaries there, and uh, this is worth really digging into. There's so much here, I won't be able to cover it all. I'll cover the highlights here. In um, this passage, by Christ, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, we, we see Christ is supreme as creator of all things and as head of the church. Uh, he alone is the head of the church. It's Christ's church. No man, no minister, no denomination or organization has control of this church. This one is headed up by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the head. Um, I call it the the invisible church. There are church buildings on many corners in the United States and other parts of the world, but this church um, consists of true believers in Jesus Christ who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. They are led by the Spirit. Uh, that is the true church. Those are the folks that are on their way to heaven. We see Christ himself personally secured salvation for those who believe in him through his death on the cross. This was pleasing to God the Father. I have debates with people sometimes that seem to think that all roads lead to heaven. Um, one religion is just as good as another, and, and uh, I may catch some real static on this, but according to Jesus Christ, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6. And based on Jesus' own words, I believe with all my heart that he alone can save us. There are other systems of belief, other religions, but Jesus Christ is the only one who has literally physically died to pay for our sins, and he's the only one who rose from the dead. So I don't see how the other ones could, could, could do that. I don't see how they can assure one that they will be accepted by God the Father who owns heaven and earth, and Jesus is his uh, only begotten Son. So it stands to reason if it's God's heaven and God um, has given his only begotten Son for us uh, to be saved through faith in him, I don't believe any of the others are going to uh, be able to deliver. Uh, Jesus, on the other hand, can and will. He has all power. All power has been given to him in heaven and on earth. Uh, you can see that clearly in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Your soul depends on on a right relationship with Jesus Christ. So look into Scripture. I believe with all my heart the Bible is God's inspired Word, and I teach that. I've actually asked the Lord to strike me dead rather than let me misteach His Word, and I sincerely mean that. Well, we'll go to the next passage here, Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, and the title of this is Through His Death. Through His Death. This is um, the only way our sins could have been paid for. It required the death of Christ himself. So he died. He died for us, and it was through his death that we were redeemed in verse 21, once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions. 
But now, he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. And then verse 23, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. The Apostle Paul is crystal clear in his assessment of the gospel. He proclaims it without any reservations whatsoever as to its truth. He's um, telling the world that Jesus Christ is the one and only Savior. Uh, He points many, many times to Jesus and him crucified. He he says, I'm going to proclaim Christ and him crucified. And those who put their faith in Christ, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, can rest in his promises. Jesus makes those promises in many places in Scripture. Matthew chapter 10, uh, verse uh, 32, he says, uh, If you will confess me publicly, if you will confess me before men, then I, Jesus Christ, will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. So in the next verse now, he says, If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. Uh, that's plain as can be as to what he means. He says what he means, and he means what he says. So be sure your faith is in Christ alone for salvation. Now there's a passage here in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, and beginning at verse 27. Jesus is teaching here, and he says, My sheep listen To my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's a good description of people who are believers and are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus goes on in 1028 I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them from my hand. (laughs) My Father who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one can snatch them from my Father's hand. That's from the Net Bible. That that Net Bible is an outstanding translation. Uh, There's a Dallas uh, Theological Seminary that put that up. It's free on the Internet. Just Google Net Bible, N-E-T Bible, and it's free online but it has tremendous study notes. The bottom line here is um, the person whose faith is in Christ is secure because Christ uh, will assure um, their salvation. He's made that promise here. No one can snatch them from my Father's hand. So much to think about here. It's through his death that uh, people's sins were paid for, Uh, The Colossian believers were once separated from God by their evil actions, but were reconciled to God through Jesus' death. And Paul has challenged them just to remain faithful to the gospel, which had been proclaimed to them by Paul. Um. The idea is just simply out of gratitude to Jesus Christ and to God the Father for what they have done for us. Uh, Continue to be faithful to Christ. Uh, Don't uh, take for granted what uh, the price was to pay for your sins. Uh, Live a life of thanksgiving to God and uh, and, uh, obedience to God, understanding his will and, uh, and 
being glad to do his will because you're not on death row. You're not on your way to eternal separation from God. You're, you're on your way into his eternal kingdom. So out of just sheer gratitude, not to earn salvation or to uh, earn anything at all, uh, just out of gratitude, just determined to live out the life that you have now received as a child of God. Just live it out. And um, we'll go through here. To summarize our lesson here today, the power of the gospel frees us from sin and from Satan's control. I don't know if you've ever really given that serious thought. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, it says that uh, we're basically under the control of the prince of the power of the air. He's the spirit that works in the hearts of people who do not believe. Um, we were all born as uh, sinners, and we served a, a spirit, an evil spirit that resided in our hearts, and uh, we were slaves of Satan until we were born again or born from above, until we were set free from that death grip that Satan had on us. It takes the power of Christ Jesus and to set us free from Satan. We can't just escape Satan in our own power. Christ uh, is the only one who can release us from Satan. So Christ himself, let me put this back over there, Christ enables believers to live a God-honoring life. If you're able to live a God-honoring life, it's because Christ is, has enabled you to do so. <laughs> Christ alone has the power to free us from sin. Um, Christ's death makes it possible for people to be reconciled to God. Let's talk about this second point just a little bit. Christ, through his sinless life, which he has freely imparted to us, through his life inside us, in his mind inside us, we're free from sin. Uh, it doesn't mean we'll get it right every time, but we choose to not sin. We're, we're free now to choose not to sin. In the past, we were unable to resist sin. Sin had us, and we served sin. In Christ now, we can serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He's in us, and he has the power. Paul uh, said in Philippians last week, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I would never be able to resist sin in my own strength, but Christ in me and my simply acknowledging that Christ is in me, I can resist sin. I don't always do it. I don't always get it right. But the idea is his power, his Holy Spirit is inside us, and we are totally dependent upon him to resist sin, and we choose to exercise that uh, restraint, knowing that it'll displease God if we sin. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, that means to do uh, things he's warned us about doing. Don't, And then you can also quench the Holy Spirit. That means not to obey him when he's leading you to do something. Uh, those, those are discussed in Ephesians grieving and quenching, but um, the idea is, why would you oppose Christ after all he's done for you? Why not cooperate with him fully? Uh, resist sin, let the devil flee, don't grieve the Holy Spirit who saved you, and don't quench him when he's guiding you to do something. Typically, if the Lord leads you into uh, action, if he's got to work for you, someone to call, uh, uh, someone to help, or someone to witness to, there's a blessing in that for you. And the person, uh, the, the deepest blessings I've ever received have just been from doing what God showed me to do. It's a, it's a joy. It's a joy. It's a pleasure. And I, I, I don't know how to impress that. Try it. <laughs> just do what he shows you to do. Well, let me go over here again to that slide. Christ enables believers to live a God-honoring life. Christ has the power and, and grants that power to us to free us from sin. And then Christ's death uh, makes it possible for people to be reconciled to God. What a blessing that is. All right. 
Now I'm going to go over here to this uh, last slide here. How does that's not the last one, but we're close. How does Christ's supremacy reassure and encourage you? Now, for everyone who has faith in Christ, if you stop and think through these things that we've discussed, Christ himself is supreme over all authorities, from Satan himself, all the fallen angels, all the unclean spirits, and whatever other beings there may be in the supernatural realm, no matter who they are, Christ is supreme over all authorities and all rulers. And every person and uh, every being will one day bow to Jesus. Christ is supreme over all sin. No sin is too much for Christ to cover. Sometimes I have people come to me and they think they've done too much or for some reason they can't be forgiven. Well, the blood of Christ and Christ's death on the cross is absolutely sufficient to cover anything we may have done. If we'll humble ourselves, come to him in repentance and faith, our sin, that sin and all other sins will be completely forgiven. Well, Christ is supreme over death. We don't need to fear death. As I get older and I realize that I, I will die one day, it's good to meditate on your own death. It'll happen. Realize that Christ is supreme over death. He raised several people in Scripture, and then when he died on the cross, he rose from the dead himself. Uh, I've looked that up there. In some cases, it says God raised him from the dead. Some some. He raised himself from the dead. In other places, it's the Holy Spirit. So the bottom line is he conquered death absolutely and completely, and we don't need to fear death. For a believer, it's simply uh, departing from this life to be with the Lord. Um, a classic example of a, a biblical death is Stephen as he's being stoned to death in the book of Acts. He's being put to death by those stones, but he's He's looking up to see Jesus, and he's praying for those that are killing him. He's not concerned at all about the fact that he's about to die. He's asking God to forgive them. Don't hold this sin against them. That's the way to die right there. He's not afraid of dying. He's more concerned about what's going to happen to his murderers. So look at that and look at how Paul faced death with, with great courage and, and total peace about it. Believers can face physical death in, in absolute peace. Well, Christ is supreme over creation. Nothing is outside of his control. No storm, no um, <laughs> meteor or anything hurtling through space, no nation on earth, no there's nothing that can stand against uh, God, and he's in absolute control. And Christ eventually will reconcile everything. All will come together according to God's plan. Christ Jesus sustains everything, and he will sustain us. Well, a couple of points here. He, as the creator and as the sustainer, um, of everything. He's supreme over everything visible and everything invisible. There's a much larger world around us than that which we can see. Christ created it. He's still sovereign over it. He is absolutely authoritative. And uh, bottom line, we are completely dependent upon him. So the best thing we could do is humble ourselves, admit our need for his forgiveness, come to him in repentance, and he will receive us gladly. Well, I love you, and I thank you for being with me. Father, thank you for my hearers today. Thank you for everybody who's uh, given their time and prayers to uh, this, this study. I, I pray, Lord, that you will speak to each one who's listened to me today. I pray that they'll hear your voice, they'll hear your spirit speaking to him deep in the recesses of their own spirit. And I just pray these same things that Paul prayed. I pray that each hearer will know your will. They'll 
be filled with your wisdom and spiritual understanding, and that they'll all walk worthy of the Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, everybody, for joining me, and may God bless you.